So my main research question, the thing that interests me most is sound and the way people think about sound and how they define it and how they use it. This interests me uh, in day-to-day -day life around me, the things I listen to uh, in my society. Uh, but uh, in my research, I focus on early and early medieval China. For example, in early China, uh, sound, organized sound, measured sound, calculated sound is something that is, of course, related to music, but it is also related to things like the calendar, weights and measures, astronomy, and prognostication. And this is very interesting because it gives us a new perspective uh, on how to think about sound. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So in order to answer my question, I have three main building blocks. The first building block is to find the text. Just find where the information that I need exists, if it exists. For that, I use uh, received sources, printed sources, or excavated sources, which gives me another step that is uh, you know, transcribing or using someone else's transcription and, and uh, comparing to my own in order to, to just decipher what is uh, in an excavated text. And archaeological artifacts, for example, samples of weights and measures from the time uh, that I'm researching. The second building block is just extracting the data, which requires translation of the text. And the text also has numbers, it has algorithms, so formulas, mathematical formulas, in my case of pitches and uh, calculation of sound, organization of scales. I have to understand the musical system that appears in this text and how it is organized and how it is calculated. So this whole act of translation uh, in order to get uh, uh, something in front of you that you can then work with. And the third building block uh, is putting all of that uh, in relation to the society that I am researching because these kind of sources are, all sources are not created in a, va in a vacuum. Uh, they are a product of the society um, that the, you know, the authors of the, the texts live in. In early China, uh, like in early worlds, there is no dichotomy between uh, themes, between topics, between subjects. Everything is connected uh, in, in one way or another. And so we have to understand how the authors of these texts thought about sound and how they thought about the world, how they thought about how the world around them functioned. In addition to, of course, the political reality, the social reality, historical background of this uh, time. So for my findings, I would like to highlight um, the relationship between sound and measurement and how sound is seen as a measurement in early China. Sound was considered uh, detectable, measurable. You could calculate it and then measure it on a pipe, on a string, or give it a number, right? And, and create this kind of relative model where you only use numbers to create pitches. Sound is um, measuring also other things. What is it measuring? Something called qi. T is a term that most people are familiar with. It's very prevalent in Asia. It's a little bit hard to define. One of these definitions for T that Nathan Sivan gave was that it is a thing that is at the basis of all things and all transformation of all things. Sound is detecting the transition of this T from the beginning of the year, which was at the winter solstice, all the way through the summer solstice and back again to the winter solstice. And this also applies to another very familiar term that we know called yin and yang. And so the winter solstice is the highlight of the yin, the yang starting to rise all the way to the summer solstice. And the summer solstice yin begins to rise all the way back to the winter solstice. And so these layerings of yin, yang, qi, sound, and seasonal changes are all put together to create a model of how the cosmos functions. And this is important especially to one particular person, which is the emperor, because his power is very dependent on his ability to synchronize with the cosmos and with the synchronicity 
uh, rule over his realm. And when something in that entire model is off balance, for example, if your sound is not correct, right, that is an indicator that something is wrong. And so then either his officials uh, will tell him that he needs to uh, do something or maybe even change the music, stop listening to bad music, which, you know, you, you have to define bad music in order to do that, or uh, uh, change something in the way that he's ruling. Um, but in any case, this is an indicator of things he has to do in order to keep his power. So let me show you two ways that these findings are uh, relevant. The first is the way we think about sound, new ways to think about sound. For example, even in the world around us, uh, sound is being used for so many other things that are not music. Yeah. One example would be uh, the echo machine or ultrasound machine where we can see a fetus in the womb. And there are plenty of other examples, sonar and so on. If we allow ourselves to step out of our own way and let the texts that we are reading lead us, then we can really discover how other people in other times, in different societies, thought about sound. In order to do that, we really have to be aware, first of all, of our preconceptions, be able to set them aside, which is not very easy to do, and just let the information, you know, take us one step further every time. The second way that this, uh, these findings are relevant is that so much research has been dedicated to uh, early Greece and early Greek conceptions of sound, Pythagoras, Pythagorean tuning, the Pythagorean comma later on, and so on. But early Chinese conceptions of sounds are ex extremely intricate, and we find a very complex musical system, and we have evidence of a complex and intricate musical system, not only starting at the point of these texts that we're talking about today, but also from uh, inscriptions on bells from the fifth century BC that show a very uh, intricate and complex musical uh, system. And this allows us to kind of broaden our scope and look at a wider array of uh, conceptions on sound. So for the past two years, I've been uh, leading a research group and we are looking into uh, different aspects of society after the fall of the Han Empire when uh, a period called the period of division comes about. This is an unstable, uh, precarious period where things are changing. New knowledge is constantly uh, either coming in or created, discovered. Buddhism is flourishing in China. Ways of thinking about time and space and sound uh, is changing. New instruments, for example, are showing up. I am looking at what happened to these cosmological models that were holding the empire up, like as, as we said before, now that uh, you know, everything has crashed, they, they have you know, not proven themselves, actually. And uh, I'm focusing on debates that are happening in the establishment of new dynasties, short or long dynasties, that use uh, these models, especially uh, in relation to ritual music. And I try to see how different models are being used by uh, different officials at court to bash each other or actually bash points of view or uh, entire uh, models on which they think this new dynasty should be uh, established. So even a small discussion about the number of bells that's going to be used in, in, uh, in ritual music actually holds behind it a very, very um, heated debate about worldviews and entire cosmologies.